All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my first episode as I have, uh, I have taken over the Asians Represent podcast from Daniel. This is mine now. All nerdy <laughs> anime shit all the time. Uh, no, but actually, uh, my name is Leona McKenzie. I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I will now, I will be uh, leading uh, episodes kind of in the in the more like anime, video games, JRPGs sort of vein. Uh, much like how today we will be talking about a game that's near and dear to my heart, Final Fantasy XIV, alongside these two wonderful people. Uh, but uh, beyond that, you know, uh, you can look forward to more content like this in the future. And Pam, if you would like to say a few words to introduce yourself. Hello. I'm surprised that uh, the audience is currently not sick of me. I'm back talking about my favorite theme in we the world. We can never be sick of you, Pam. It's too amazing. <laughs> So I used to be one of the admin for Asians Represent, but the community continues to be near and dear to my heart. I'm Pam Punzalan, speaking from Burlington, Ontario this time, when a lot of my episodes were in the Philippines. So I'm in the proper time zone this time to relate with all of you. I do design work, editing, consulting. You can find me in Balmung Crystal. Look for the small angry dark knight. Excellent. And then uh, Bashir, if you would. Hello, I'm Bashir Gauss, um, writer, designer, periodic guest on Asians Represent, um, and uh, a I play a gunbreaker on Aether Adamantois. Uh, look for the maximum height gunbreaker aura if you are looking for me. Oh my god, no wonder I was so tiny, because I'm like min height here. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just amazed that you're here at all, because no one plays here. In 14. Uh, I should probably say I, I, I am also a Kazane Shiba in uh, also either Adamantois, uh, hanging with the the crafters of the Adamantois, um, the Adamantois server. So uh, with all that said, we had a few things to go over before we get going. Uh, first off, uh, the Crit Awards. Uh, as you may have seen on social media, uh, the Crit Awards are going. Uh, Asians Represent has been nominated, uh, as well as a number of other great kind of TTRPG-related uh, um, podcasts or uh, shows, all kinds of fun things. So, like, there's a lot of great people to support there, and we would very much appreciate it if you also go and support us. Uh, so... Uh, I imagine there will be some kind of a link in the chat. Um, There we go. Excellent. Uh, And then, uh, yeah, please come out and support us and support a lot of other great content creators and designers uh, who have been nominated. Um, Beyond that, I did want to give a quick warning before we jump into this. Uh, Final Fantasy XIV is a game that does deal with some more mature themes, while the the subject matter is generally handled in, in more of a light or PG-13 manner. Uh, we will be discussing themes of colonialism, sexual slavery, and sexual violence, uh, especially with regards to a certain character in Doma, those of you who know, know. Um, so we will be talking about that. Uh, we will generally try and be frank and respectful, but if you are not in the right headspace to deal with that, we absolutely understand. Uh, so just please be aware, and I will also warn before we start the segment and get into the heavier topics. Uh, but all of that said, um, as a study of fantasy world building from an Asian perspective, Final Fantasy XIV offers one of the most complete and in-depth case studies in modern media. A massively multiplayer online RPG by Japanese industry giant Square Enix, uh, the game does boast an estimated 42 million players, uh, which is a lot. <laughs> um, but what makes 14 unique is this focus on storytelling and characters. Um, despite being an MMORPG, it is often considered by fans to be uh, what it would be what we call an RPG MMO. Uh, the storyline and the world are central to the experience, and then the massively multiplayer components uh, exist to enhance the the overall experience. The world of 14 exists in a fully realized blend of fantasy and science fiction. Uh, And while it does draw uh, extensively from Western fantasy for its inspiration, it is at its heart quintessentially a Japanese story and world. Um, 
While no piece of media is perfect, 14 has garnered such a huge player base in no small part due to the time and attention of director and producer Naoki Yoshida. Uh, he and his team infuse the game with and uh, infuse the game and the community around it with a sense of enthusiasm and community that keeps players engaged and excited. Uh, the team shows genuine passion and enthusiasm and a clear intent to do right by the players and, and the places that have inspired them. Um, so today we are going to be discussing the world building of Final Fantasy XIV. We're going to look at some of its successes and some of its failures. And we're going to focus in on how it portrays Asian cultures uh, and the diverse range of inspirations that it draws from. Uh, in general, a lot of kind of our lens is that we, we believe that the team means well. Uh, we also acknowledge that sometimes they don't hit their mark. Um, sometimes they do. And I think it's important for us to discuss and talk about these things uh, and, and how they're handled, maybe what could have been done better, um, and, and the notable successes when, when they're there. Also, apparently, apparently, I, I now have boba-related things that I'll need to worry about. That wasn't that wasn't in the uh, takeover orientation. <laughs> yeah, so you're gonna have to answer that question at the end. Fantastic. The Whatever that is. <laughs> what is your favorite class, and what uh, and what boba drink would it be? We will we will put that on hold for now. Um, but uh, first, though, let's jump right into it. Um, in terms of ordering, I am going to give a blanket warning that we're going to have a lot of spoilers in this chat. Um, mostly we'll be focusing on the storylines and characters more so than like the broader plot points, but uh, I'm going in least to most spoily order. Uh, so we will begin with the Asium step uh, of the Stormblood uh, main expansion. We will talk about Alamigo, which will cover some of the Stormblood main expansion and post content. Uh, we will then talk about Doma. Um, we'll author the region Sodoma and Kugane, which will cover a lot of the Stormblood main and patch uh, content. And then Thavnair, finally, which will get into some Endwalker spoilers. So also be warned for that. Uh, but I first wanted to start with the Azim Steppe, which I think is a very interesting region. Uh, the Azim Steppe uh, is very much based on kind of this sort of Eurasian, like Turkish, Mongolian feel. Uh, and they have they have this this wonderful culture about them, but they also do delve in some stereotypes. Um, and now that I've done all my monologuing and talking, I wanted to open this up to Pam and Bashir uh, to give kind of your thoughts on the Azim step as we as we get into this. So simultaneously the Azim, the step is one of the coolest parts of the game. Like, that's why I play Azela. That's why a lot of people play Azela. Right. But also, yeah. it does just kind of dive into, like, preconceptions about the Mongols and, like, steppe nomads in, step nomads in general and Turkic peoples to a lesser degree. It, um, and it has what, like, it's generally called like positive racism uh, or like the noble savage stereotypes of like these people who are in touch with nature or like in touch with the wilds and the primal side and as such are way stronger than everyone else. Um, but it, there are also bits where like it's notably respectful of their culture in some of the conversations that come up. Right. It uh, portrays them as legitimate in a way that the game, and I think this is what kind of makes it notable, the game struggled to do that earlier, where earlier, like when you're dealing, the, the step is basically what would be a beast tribe in uh, heaven's word or in the base game that's right yeah. um in terms of their relationship with society but it's portrayed as like legitimate it's portrayed as a place like where with a culture that's worth respecting that you ally with instead of a default hostile um it's also doing what like is common in some other works what i personally call the kengan Ashura phenomenon in a reference that will make sense to very few people where you immediately know the author thinks these guys are the hypest shit in the world. They're the coolest thing imaginable. And that doesn't excuse the stereotypes being uh, delved into, but it uh, it does like change the context of it from what you're used to like dealing with. And that's also why so many players go, this is awesome. My warrior of light is from here. Yeah. Yeah. I am... Um... 
So I have a lot of feelings, much of it salty about Stormblood in general, right? So when I was playing, like, okay, let's start with like Fangirl Pam, right? When I was playing, the steps were a breath of fresh air. However, this, a lot of the attempts at representation, I feel, ended up being minimized by what occurs in the main story where you have the situation of like cool Greek culture, wonderful people, especially if you actually take the time out to do some of the yellow quests and like delve into the lore or talk to people and kind of just observe what's happening there. But you have the overarching idea of like, we're going to take these like noble, savage, badass people. We're going to supposedly respect their culture and then sick them at the bad guy. And I'm like, I'm having some major shaky Philippine colonized feelings over here on how uncomfortable that is. So it felt like a huge, it was like we stepped forward in a big way and then we like kind of backslid again. And then from there it was like the gift that keeps on giving in a not so great way in many ways, which is um, a general problem of Stormblood. The, like I, I've heard a lot of people say that it's the patch that could have been. Uh, in general, with a lot of um, potential, a lot of interesting story seeds, and a lot of leads that ended up getting buried by some otherwise help, head tilt um, <laughs> decisions. Now, I don't really have a lot of authority to speak on the specific like cultures that are portrayed there because that's not really my wheelhouse. So I'm gonna lean a lot on my <laughs> on on my friends over here. But yeah, generally that that's like the main feeling I was left with with respect to to the steps great writing cool cool gains not so great ending for me yeah i think that's worth noting um because uh, as pam said in the step you you go in and they which again going into the noble savage thing they have a Mm -hmm. ritual combat to decide their next time um Side note, uh, apparently they are using kind of the more Turkish pronunciations in all of these. Uh, I have seen it called out by a Turkish YouTuber before. Um, so like, that's super cool. Like, oh, especially since Turkish people are like, hey, that's that's us. You know, like, I love to see that. Um, but, you know, you you coming in as not Azela, very different experience. Like Bashir being Azela, you know, it's like you're coming home, right? And you are going to lead your people into battle. But like I play, I play a rain, uh, which is not, which is kind of the other side of the, um, of the Aura uh, group. And there, there you see them more like sitting in a bubble underwater in Suinosato. So like that feels kind of colonizing, colonizing to me. Uh, and like Pam, you know, you've got a, a here um, who's coming in. So like that doesn't, that doesn't feel good. Yep. Yeah, one hundred percent. Where like it's it's not good unless you go like it's enormously problematic unless you go in with that very specific out like setup. And even then, it's still like uh, it's kind of one of the things we'll get into with Alamigo for it, I guess. Where like um, it's kind of a parallel to that, even if you are going in with like the most connected your character can uh-huh. be. Um, where it's very much playing into you know you rally these people on the borderlands to come in and invade and do what you need them to do. Um, I do have to agree that, like, you can tell that the warriors think they're just, like, the absolute coolest. <laughs> yeah. Even Magna gets to, like, jump off a bird and and clear yeah. out a tech into in midair. And, like, Magna the is the and- lamest... Yeah. <laughs> the one and only them. time anyone has ever respected Magna. <laughs> um, nah. <laughs> Still Not even. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> close, close. A little close. As close as you can get. But um, I did actually, uh, I also want to talk about not Magna, but uh, Sadu Tune. Yeah, Sadu's great. Um, because uh, I actually got to play through um, sort of experience Stormblood again because my friend's been streaming his playthrough. Uh, I, I personally, I really liked Stormblood. I admit that it is messy and problematic, but I find it very interesting in that kind of space of just like, there were, there's a lot of ambition. There's a lot of generally good intent. Uh, and there's, there are interesting things to say. And while they don't always succeed, it, you know, like I, 
it lands really well for me because it hits that nice sweet spot for me. Um, but uh, one of the things that I found very striking, especially watching the replay and getting reminded of it, is when you take Gosetsu. So Gosetsu is a samurai of Doma, and Doma is a kind of feudal Japanese inspired area. So like when you go into the province of Yangsha, you see people working the rice paddies. They have kind of that traditional peasant attire. Uh, and it is, a at this point, a colonized nation. So Gosetsu is a rebel, and when he goes into the Dotharal camp, he finds that they are believers in kind of this very, very focused reincarnation cycle where the Dotharal believe that they are, they are, they will reincarnate into their tribe. So when they die, they will come back with the next cycle of birth, and you will see the person who has died and they will step into their old identity. Um, the gender doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, Sadhu, the leader of the Dotharal, is said to have been a man in the last three incarnations, but is now a woman and she doesn't care. Um, she is who she is and she is amazing. Um, and also terrifying as anyone who's ever uh, seen the countdown what with her two like big stone pillar heads and started freaking out can tell you. Uh, because she can and will just completely wipe the area if you let her. Um, but when you go there, Gosetsu, who has who has kind of that traditional, more Shinto-inspired belief uh, as befits a samurai of Doma, is very caustic to the belief because he's horrified that this person who died and he saw died, they just leave this body to the crow because they're like, well, the spirit's gone. It's just the flesh cage. Who cares? Uh, and the look this... This man gets when he walks into the camp is absolutely withering. And he has to kind of reflect on that, which I thought was very interesting. So I kind of like to hear your guys' thoughts on like that whole sequence of like the Dotharal and and how how they respect the culture, especially because they're kind of implied to be right. <laughs> well, I, I really like the fact that they're well, for one, they're just so badass, right? Because if I recall correctly, oh, it's been ages since I played Stormblood, right? Or it feels like ages. They believe they're the deathless ones, right? That's their whole moniker. They do not die. And um, I kind of want to just like point out the progression here uh, with respect to representation in general that is not like white representation. Anybody who has played Blue Mage knows how terribly problematic that entire like thing is with the new world and it very obviously tokenizing uh, people indigenous to America. It's like there is that's inexcusable, right? And then they tried to turn it into a gimmicky class, which for me just makes it triply worse, right? And I'm not even indigenous, so I can only imagine what my friends who are would feel. But then you get to the you get to the to Saru and her tribe, you get to the rest of the Asim step, and you see that they individually tried with each tribe to give them something that uh, that is nuanced, that is different. And kind of like if, if you reflect on it as a story writer, it's like a good exercise in, okay, if I was to make an other, how would I do it? And how would these others view themselves? And how would they determine their own laws and traditions? And what I love the most about Sadhu especially is she's very unapologetic about it, along with the rest of her people. She's like, you don't respect us. I don't have to respect you. You play by my rules. Like you're here. You listen to us, you do things our way, or you walk. And they have no problem at all ignoring you or just saying, oh, the, the world's ending? Well, too bad. You didn't respect us. You're just going to have to go through the, the ways you don't want to do it. Well, I guess you got to fuck off, right? That's that's what I love the most about it. It's not like, oh, no, this the, these foreigners, they're, they're here to save the world. We're just going to throw all of our culture out the door. They don't do that. They're like doesn't seem like our problem yet to me and then that's great as far as i'm concerned <laughs> yeah and i think it's kind of notable even within stormblood in both alamigo and in like doma you kind of have like uh, either subclasses or a main quest thing where like this place needs to change and reform or be more like someone else it's really noticeable in like the alamigo monk art class quest if you ever play them or a job quest if you ever play them i don't particularly like that I really d actively dislike how it treats Alamigo and Alamigan traditions in that quest. 
Um, whereas, like, when you do the various side content around um, step step culture in the step, uh, it's always like, okay, this outsider needs to learn to perform in the expectations of this to be allowed to do stuff here. There's like a side quest with like some trader who's just trying to sell stuff there mm-hmm. and keeps making faux pas. And the thing isn't like, how do I make them ignore that I'm making these faux pas? It's like, okay, how do I do this approach? How do I stop messing up? Um, uh, when uh, the like the various things were like, yeah, you where? Oh, geez, I'm blanking on it. Um, the main plot of of the thing where you are trying to get them to ally with you and go through it after then, uh, all of that's done and like you are the Kagan of the step and they've agreed to follow you in uh he and the npc who's nominally in charge tries to give everyone an order and in line with local culture they completely ignore him because that's they're not suddenly playing by someone else's rules and like it's what it's i think a big part of why even though it does have a lot of these issues with like um uh even though it has some of these issues with like noble savages and um exo- like exotification of the other like it's very keen on making sure that individual their uh individual parts of it have their own cultures like there's the group that doesn't speak there's the ones that like only adopt in members etc and making sure that none of them are treated as like wrong or in need of change just because they're different and I do know that there's even a tribe which one of my friends in game plays. Uh, she made a, a character from that specific tribe where it's like the gender roles are, are totally reverse. So the guys are the ones who do all of the female roles. But you also know that in general, nobody really gives a shit in that area of town. Um, and again, just like a little like side note. It's very, I can't emphasize this enough, it's very, very different. Because if you, again, do side quests from, let's say, Ishgard, where you could literally walk down the street and somebody's gossiping about their maid who is like, oh, scandal. She has, she's with child. I saw her, her belly grow, right? This is so obviously French, it hurts, right? Um, but in the Asim Sep, it's like, he, she, they, meh, whatever. These are our cultures. Fucking respect it, you know. So the people of the step are gender, and it is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. But uh, all that to say, uh, I think I think the step really represents some of the best and worst of what cultural writing can be in Final Fantasy. Uh, and part of that, of course, is driving the plot, since Stormblood is very focused around this, like, big building an alliance to take out the evil empire, fighting back against colonialism. Um, so the end the end goal of the step has to be the alliance. That's why you're here in the first place. But within it, you're able to get this kind of cool outlook into the peoples who are completely different and who all would be fine if you just fucked off and and didn't darken their doorstep again. (laughs) And I love that for them. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I got intimately reminded of the whole Kagan thing when I did the warrior quests, where uh, they do actually, you do run into them and they do call you Kagan and there's even this really funny sequence. Sorry, spoilers for the warrior quest, by the way. Um, It's not that great until this quest line anyway. (laughs) Yeah, sure. But like, you basically get propositioned. Where they're like, "Will you marry my daughter?" And that that happens regardless of your of your warrior life's gender. So you do have this whole thing of like, "Oh, right, because I'm the I am the greatest of them, right?" So it's, it's another funny cultural moment. My character is like very gay and very married, so it was hilarious because if you do have a character who is married in game, there is another option where you're like, "You do know that I'm promised to somebody, right?" I don't think you get that if if you're single. So it's quite cute. Absolutely wonderful. Um, Did we have anything else we wanted to say on this step? We have a bit more time if we want to, but also All Amigo is coming up, and I know we all have a lot to say on All Amigo. Uh, Yeah, just I think um, if you're playing Azela, I think it's the most the game feels different for playing someone from a region. Um, That's kind of, I feel, is worth noting. Uh, Like, especially the climax of that quest, it's kind of, 
you're the diaspora kid who comes home and makes good. Um, and I think it does that better than, say, Alamigo does, even though that's another thing where you could kind of make your character be from there. Um, and the game's fairly limited in how it acknowledges that. I think there are, like, two or three lines of dialogue somewhere where it mentions that this is a thing. Um, but, uh, like, kind of the same as how it'd be handled elsewhere. But it definitely, the nature of the quest line there makes it feel more involved than it does for uh, some of the other ones that I'll be, <laughs> that we'll get into shortly. <laughs> it hits different. It hits different in a good way, yeah. though. All right. I, I can feel myself bracing for El Amigo, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Alamigo. Um, so for background, Mostly. Alamigo, Al, we are, we're, I do want to address this. Um, so Alamigo was a region that was conceived in the original 1.0 version of Final Fantasy XIV, which, as many people know, is bad. 1.0 is bad. It was very, very bad. Um, they completely messed it up. Uh, they designed it in a way that no, like, mortal person would actually derive enjoyment from. They made flower pots that required more uh, polygons than player characters to just completely crash uh, Gridania. It was bad. Um, within it, Alamigo was planned as one of the main starter cities. Uh, and I definitely get the impression that... Alamigo wasn't fully solidified culturally at the time of 1.0 um, because one of the major characters you see in Alamigo, uh, Asilia, or later Minfilia Ward, is blonde white lady. <laughs> uh, her father, Warburton, also a blonde guy. He looks kind of dark skinned, but like Minfilia is a very very pretty white lady who apocryphally had a model that had breasts so large that they couldn't move it properly, so they kind of strained her to a room <laughs> in, order, in order to not break the model. Not a great start. Um, and, fr and, and from there, uh, as, as A Realm Reborn starts to play a factor, your first as you get into A Realm Reborn, your first kind of interaction with Alamigo is that there is a refugee crisis in Ulda, Ulda being the monetarist city of greed and hateful tiny Lalafell who uh, who run run the show basically, and you like there's a lot like ARR does not handle this well. I think we can all agree on that. There's a lot of, like, blame them because they're poor. Uh, it doesn't go over well. But by the time you get to Stormblood, there's definitely a intention to treat it with more nuance. But I definitely feel like, and I'm, I want your thoughts in a second after I say it, I definitely feel like 1.0 held it back, much in the same way that if someone were to remake Cara Terror, or, El or Rokugan in L5R, as we have seen, they can't really divorce themselves from their in initial lore enough to make it okay. I also feel, this is a visceral feeling, so I'm going to premise it with that, right? And perhaps in once will come later through the discussion or when I reflect on it on a Twitter thread or whatever, right? But like, I was given the impression from ARR onwards that they will eventually liberate this place that you've heard so much about that you've seen their people go through literal hell and back it's in the side content it's in the main story content it's touched upon in some job quests right like they deserved a liberation worthy of great gameplay that we all know ff14 was capable of delivering so when the majority of stormblood did not actually happen <laughs> in that fashion i felt like they shafted an entire nation that should have seen a new dawn like because you end up going you, it's almost like you end up going literally everywhere except yeah. to this very important place that even has a little alamigo full of people with their own problems 
doing desperate, terrible things because of their situation, right? So it was, it, it, I've honestly hated it a lot. And yep. I continue to look at those regions. Even, and they're, they're really beautiful, by the way. Like if you're ever bored, if you're on FF14 and you're ever bored, or if you ever just want to like look at how pretty the game is, fly around El Amigo. It's beautiful. There's so many interesting spots that get zero lore, zero to minimal context. And I just feel sad that that we didn't get that. Like, I'm I'm very happy that we got to liberate Doma. That was great. But like Alamigo ended up getting eclipsed by that whole thing. And it is super hard to ignore the fact that. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way, right? So they went for the cooler Asians instead of like the brown people, and they went that's for their own least... story, really. Yeah, right. Well, and yeah. The, I honestly, I, I felt like that sucked so much. Like I can't even begin to explain how much it sucks. Like uh, the the Alamigo Liberation Dungeon was super cool, but that the fact that that's pretty much all you get beyond a little bit of build up. And then the the fact that design wise the city isn't even really a city at all mm -hmm. super sucks for me. So that's my long and short like rant over Alamigo and Stormblood. Yeah, Blood. yeah, I'm basically with Pam on this one. Like, I wasn't aware of any of the 1.0 stuff, but I don't think it really affects that much what we get into the game besides how it's set up. Uh, because like the execution of it, you get things like the monk job quest, where the core concept is, yeah, the Alamegan way, traditional way of fighting is out of date and must be changed to keep up with the times because it's just worse than the Garlean one. Or um, you get like you get a a bunch of the central characters of it turning into a fair and lovely commercial. Um, you have like it kind of sets up. This is going to be the Alamegan like resistance and liberation movement, and then you just end up in on the other side of the continent for most of that movement, and then you just kind of pop back over for the finale. Um, and like your big kind of oh, we can actually defeat the Garleans thing that happens in Doma. Um, <laughs> And that didn't need to, it did not need to be set up like that. That was a voluntary choice made. There are very cool moments. There are very cool dungeons. There's a lot of setup for cool stuff. And then it's just kind of undercut. And a lot of it is disappointing or kind of left abandoned or just really very much well, we didn't care that much about our not Afghanistan, not Pakistan, Pakistan kind of area. Um, it's <laughs> I'm not thrilled about it. Uh, I, th like, I feel like it's worth pointing out too that like you just lose in all yeah, amigo, all you lose. That's true. And they just that is true. Their resistance. That is like mm -hmm. all of these like brave brown people who are trying to like stir the flames of rebellion and get everyone and you get empire strikes back yeah and then they just they do all the rebuilding off screen and then there's lies at least <laughs> um, uh, okay, where yes so... i get that a lot of diaspora people kind of see themselves in her and etc but also come on <laughs> So let, let me defend my girl, because I am, I am a <laughs> least lover, <laughs> and I don't fucking care. Like, I... That's why I, I like her, but, like, Liana, yeah. go ahead first, right? Okay, so, Lise, there's a thing that anime does where they love to have a character who's, like, a quarter European and just looks like a fucking white person, and that's Lise. Uh... <laughs> If you if you look, we've got we've got a picture of her. Like she looks Asian. Like if you look at her features, she looks Asian. Um, super pretty, but she's also very blonde, very pale skinned. Uh, but if you pull up a picture of her father, which I have included here, his name is Curtis Hext. This motherfucker is brown. <laughs> Yeah, like, <laughs> it is a fair and lovely ad, which is like an ongoing, <laughs> look at this man, this is a fair and lovely commercial, this is the skin whitening company selling you on, 
your children could look like this. <laughs> and you know, honestly, for me, like fe- feminine, like feminine lens on, right? It's so unfair how yes. like she just disappears after that. I'm like, mm-hmm. she's so important. She has such potential. You you do get little bits of it in the story, but like as with everything, literally everything, Al amigo, it's just like. Okay, let's like wrap it up as quickly as we can. Let's go. And then they just do and other like, things. And that's <laughs> the thing too. Like Stormblood is Lisa's story. Yeah. And and that's I think part of why Stormblood is so contentious in, in a lot of the fandom is because Lisa's not a very well loved character. I have thoughts on that that I may or may not get into. But, but I really I really like how you pointed out like un- being unable to divorce yeah. 1.0 and ARR and them not locking down the culture. Because if perhaps if they had Lise wouldn't have been shafted so badly is right? what I think, right? And that, I, I really do not like it. Okay, Shadowbringer spoilers, y'all remember that trial for Bolja, which is also an entirely new region that we could end up talking about in another thing, right? Like, so I'm, not ca- I'm not carrying you two through my tactics, fan <laughs> I, I, I have spared you that. What do you mean? I want to I wanted be carried. But anyway, right, like the, the trial in Bolja, right. where you're, you're supposed to call on your friends. It, it became a Reddit meme that Lise isn't there. And I'm just like, she's, is she not your friend anymore? And I'm just like, well, she's my friend, you know? <laughs> she's my friend, but she's super busy leading El Amigo. <laughs> she's got meetings to sit in. She can't even punch people anymore. It sucks. <laughs> but I do want to talk about this and then I'll, 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 I'll definitely see the floor too because I know Bashir, you have some thoughts and I, I think they're super valid. But yeah, I will yeah. say for myself... I personally, as a biracial woman, who is, like, I'm half Vietnamese and half Scottish. And, like, that hit all kinds of weird when I'm hearing, like, Irish accents, Gaelic accents coming out of Alamegans for some reason. So, like, (laughs) I identify with Lise as a biracial diaspora person. I don't even speak my own language, right? Like I don't speak Vietnamese. Like she hit hard for me. I really resonated with her and her journey and her story. And it was very important to me, but girls should have been darker. Oh my God. Anyway, Bashir, I'm so sorry. You have the floor. Cause I know you've got shit to say. Yeah. So there is a trope in like, even in a lot of stuff about colonial resistance in India, to have, like, the lightest-skinned character take charge. Um, you have it in, like, RRR, really cool movie, um, where but they take the dude who was, like, rural and from, like, a uh, lower caste and stuff, and they portray him as basically, like, an uneducated heck when he was noticeably really intelligent historically, and he was an inspiring person historically. He wasn't just superhumanly powerful and... A, a ridiculous badass, but this is a common thing where you'll get like, um, it's not it's not quite Lawrence of Arabia, but honestly, going through it, it felt a bit like it. Where like you will have these kind of, um, and especially like Alamigan has a lot of Indian and Afga- Afghan um, inspirations, and there were large parts of it where you could kind of when Lise is in arguments with people or like where the character is in arguments with people from there about like hey, we're trying to get the resistance back together what we need to do next. You can feel like mustard arguments about going back home or about the colonial era or whatever in a lot of those. And like, I was fine with these before Stormblood. Stormblood made me much less fond of her because of how Alamigo was handled and how a lot of the time she kind of ended up like stuck with the narrative role of person who says how the authors are going to be or the writers are handling this area um and unfortunately a lot of the time the way the writers are handling this area is lakshmi or we're leaving the area for like two-thirds of the expansion or something um or whatever else is coming out and it 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 is very familiar but unlike like but unlike in the unlike the step it's very familiar almost entirely in ways that i really dislike from previous experience with them in various spaces Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, lot, lots of uncomfortable decisions were made, right? Which goes back to the whole crux of Stormblood as the patch that should have been so many interesting things, so many cool ideas, so many possible 
ways that it could have tied better, that it could have landed better, that entire people's characters, job classes could have been uh, given their due, right? Like, I I mean, if, if you asked me, Pam, what's the one thing that you wish could happen in FF, like excluding 7.0 and wild speculation there, I'd say take Stormblood, make it two pack to make it two patches or two entire expansions, go through the whole thing, show me exactly what is going on with these wonderful cultures and traditions and peoples who all suffered under the empire as well. It, I mean, they're all, they're all part of the same thing, right? They all had their, their problems and then like try to try to reclaim it. Right. And mm-hmm. like on, on a fangirl level, I do really like how the team does try in their own ways to like, Oh, this thing didn't start out so well way back in the day. Let's revisit that and let's change it. And they, it, again, it doesn't, it's not perfect. No game is. Um, even as much as I love FF, like I think my friends have heard me like rant about it for hours, right? Like the many things where I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> right? But like the the point stands that that would that would have been the dream for me if you could just let Doma, let even Dalmasca, let Boja, let Alamigo, like let all of it grow because there's just so much there that is not the default white or default fantasy Eurocentric thing that you see in Final Fantasy. And that's a whole new can of worms that we're going to try to touch on here. In you, there, you say Dalmasca and my heart hurts. I'm such a tactics <laughs> and evil East fangirl. I'm, I'm, yeah, I know. I'm, right? I'm, I'm, oh my God. Um, <laughs> but there was something else I wanted to bring up. Since we broached the subject, I think it is worth talking about some of the colorism issues that have been present in Final Fantasy. We've been kind of skirting the issue, but especially with the recent controversy with Final Fantasy 16, um, I think now is a good time to address this. Uh, I know, having read many interviews with the man, that Nakiyoshi is very well intentioned. I actually, I found... I could not find it again, but I was looking for it. There was an interview where he talks about the reason the skin tones of characters will kind of change between expansions is because they do it based on how much time that person spends indoors during a given expansion, which is a very East Asian way to look at it because a lot of East Asian and Southeast Asian too, our skin tones are highly variable. Like if we spend a lot of time outside, we will get dark. Uh, so like as a detail, I think that's very interesting. Um, just kind of as a lens to look at that concept, but it's, it is impossible to ignore that in general, dark skin characters with some notable exceptions, but for the most part, they're not the big heroes. Like if we think about dark skin characters who are very prominent, my mind immediately goes to Raban Aldin, who is an Alamegan. And his, his story has been very involved. He's a great character. He's beloved by the fandom. If you don't love Robot, and frankly, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what to say to you. How could you not? He's amazing. Um, and he, he has his whole arc and all that. But, like, who else? We can talk about... Ishtala used to be. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But, but she spends all the time indoors, so now she's white. <laughs> well, no, now she's light skinned because she don't leave the goddamn library. Um, and like, there's Ralbon, there's Ilbert, the motherfucker, <laughs> the evil Alamegan who like nearly destroys the world. So that's great. Um, Aaron Villa, as mentioned, came up and like, I'm not, I'm not into men, but like, I totally get why a lot of ladies are fawning over Aaron Villa. Like, I'm, I'm happy for you. That's awesome. I'm happy for you. <laughs> I am. And, you know, even, even on the, even on just the sheer level of design, right? The fact that many Final Fantasy XIV fans who are trying to create Warriors of Light that either represent a story that they feel like they can tell or themselves cannot find even the closest amalgamation of their skin Mm -hmm. tone if they're not on the white scale. That 
is a problem. Like, there's no way of mincing words here. That is a problem. And, and I've even, seen I've seen some gorgeous like warrior of lights who look black. Yes, but I also have heard people talk about how hard that is to do. Yes, yep. exactly right. And like the very fact that it, and, and we can even just go beyond colorism itself, right? Into f- and also facial structure, right? If you look at how Highlanders are rendered, the lack of diversity there is glaring. Mm-hmm. There should be resources that should be devoted to fixing that at this point. F styles too, right? Right. <laughs> you get an right. afro. Like, exactly. And like, there's no excuse for it anymore. And I'm saying this as a fan who loves the franchise. I've loved Final Fantasy since I was tiny. There's no, there's zero excuses for it. We can say that, yes, this is an Asian game made by Asians. That does not excuse a lot of the shortcomings. Even as I say that, and I have defended this to death, and I will continue to die on that hill, I'm not absolving the game, and never have I absolved the game, of its critical flaws. And, and if I'm I mean, being honest, I don't think the team wants you to. Like, Yeah, right? Yoshi P constantly talks about how they're doing better, and I hope, after the 16 debacle, which, for so for those who weren't aware, uh, Naoki Yoshida... Um, when asked why there weren't black people in 16, very valid question, said that they were doing a European fantasy. Uh, very bad. Please no. Also kind of US fault because like US and Europe have pushed a very white Eurocentric concept of, of Europe that mm-hmm. isn't true. And that has bled from, from our media, our media exports into the Japanese outlook. But... Mm-hmm. It was it was not good. Um, but even then, I've seen him. I have seen him interview with a trans woman, where he talks about how happy he is that people of different gender expressions and identities and sexualities can find a place here, and how the modern world is moving forward, and people need to just live with that. And that's why you can eternal bond to whatever gender you want, and why they're working on unlocking all sorts of clothes. Um, so like it's it's always and I think I feel like we talked about this with the Azim step. It's always like step forward, step back, right? Like progress is made. Agree. I think yeah, that like it's important that like even when you acknowledge that people have good intentions, that doesn't mean the mistake wasn't made. Like there are lots of things. I brought up, brought up King Ganasra earlier. That's an author who will outright promote stuff like Black Lives Matter at the end of like in his author's notes at the end of uh, volumes and stuff. That's an author with very like progressive ideas personally who will also put like deeply racist characters in his work in like the same way as the step. Um, where, like, in FF14, the fact that they'd like to do better doesn't necessarily absolve them. Um, there are things where, like, I personally think that FF14 has gotten significantly better at this over time, as we'll get to whenever we get to Thabnair. Um, But, like, it is important not to go, not to, like, over-apologize for someone, or to, like, the fact that someone's very good with one sort of marginalization, not necessarily a universal thing, um where it's very easy to make a mistake elsewhere, even with when you have, uh, even when you're pretty good at handling uh, a different type of representation. Yeah, and, and also, and, we, we also oh, have yeah, to acknowledge, that, oh, sorry, we also have to acknowledge the fact that, like, this is another reason why authenticity reading and, and cultural consultancy and um, really verifying your sources with respect to, and I'm going to just zone into this particular issue, medieval studies. Medieval studies has been politicized to make you feel like fantasy equals white Europe, to render anything that is not white invisible. And that bleeds down, as Liana already said, into how people conceptualize their worlds because and there's a thing right it becomes a, it becomes a sin of omission that <laughs> sure you didn't know any better but like let, let's dwell on that why didn't you know any better it's because all of your sources are basically lying to you so that it falls on you to be better right you, you we can expect that 
we, we need to hold these people, even our darlings, to a higher standard. Because yes, you can actually be, you, it, it's entirely possible to be racist while not being sexist or be sexist while not being racist, right? Intersections are a thing and there's no like universal, okay, they're good now. They, they just can't fuck up from here because they're trying, right? So again, like huge fan, I'll defend things to death, but it's a problem. It's 2023. <laughs> I am very excited for 16, but I'm also very, very scared on how these things will go. Um, am I still going to play it? Yes, I will play it. Will you shoot me for it? Sure, go ahead. But I will play it. I want to see how this is going to play out. Because if it does have its issues, then we can also talk about it. Be like, great game in the following fashions. But this was a terrible idea in the same way that we're talking about 14 like this. Great game, but like, look at all these problems, right? (laughs) And just to cap this off, this is why I think it's important for us to have these conversations. Because if we're not telling people and we're not going to the creator like, hey, I love your product, I love your game, whatever, but you still have some problems we don't get better. And if nothing else, the 14 team has shown that they are pretty good about taking feedback. So like, it's important for us to analyze and have these conversations about where they fell down and what they can do better. One, to try and call on them to do better, but also too, so that people who are writing similar things can look at what they're doing and maybe not fall into the same traps. Uh, You don't see a lot of triple a games with this depth of world building out of japanese studios you just don't and it's very important for us to examine from this lens like what are they doing what are they doing well what are they not doing well and speaking of that let's talk about how they write their own culture if we are uh last call on all amigo before we move on to author the widest localization name ever for a Japanese inspired continent. I, I'm I'm good because if you yeah. if you told me we're gonna go for Alamigo, I'm just gonna end up bitching about the mod class and stuff. So we're good. I'm, yeah. I'm good. I swear. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of time to, to bitch and monk about monk after hours. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, so let's talk author, uh, which means Kugane and Doma. Um, I personally I find the author segment to be very interesting. Um, the fact that they chose to make a Japanese style nation that was colonized is definitely interesting. When you see Kugane, which I see up on the screen, uh, it's this very like thriving Meiji style Japanese city, this huge metropolis with like trade and neutrality and all of that. Um, but then when you get to Doma, you have much more of that like feudal Japanese, not even necessarily Sengoku, but kind of that pre-modernization. Um, and I know having having seen other Japanese media, um, there is a lot of kind of cultural angst around like the, the Commodore Perry coming in and how that upset the status quo. Um, so seeing kind of that dichotomy between Kugane and Doma is very interesting and how they chose to portray the old style of the Doman nation as this like colonized uh, entity who has lost all power and has become a puppet, which feels very, it feels very striking to how I've seen this come up in other in other media, for example, in the most recent, um, like a dragon Ishin, where they get really get into that using kind of the Shinsengumi. And you even have that with like the Seki Segumi, who are the Shinsengumi, but wearing red, right? Like you can you can see these through lines and it's very interesting. Um and also they deal with some shit that Japan ha- like a a frequent sin that shows up in Japanese history and media of sexual slavery. So this is your warning. We're going to talk about Yotsuyu in a bit. But first, I want to I want to get our in, in, initial thoughts from Pam and Bashir on uh on author. Oh man, I don't know. Heard even start. It's like even Kugane felt like, "Oh, we're here." And then this, yeah. there were some illusions of like we do things differently. We have a political situation under wraps, but not really. Okay, bye. And I was like, 
what? <laughs> where, 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 where did we? I literally went through a boat ride with the mandatory, the sea is haunted, and fought through that to get to your port. And you're giving me all these little hints. And I just, is this nothing after that? I have to go to the samurai quest to even touch upon that ice. So now at this point, for those of you who do not know um, me as an FF14 player, yes, I'm that dirty FF14 player that 19 out all the classes. So I really went through all the, right? Respect, right? All I did the job. Same, so. Right? So, and I was like, where, where, where was <laughs> Give it. I feel like, I feel like my entire Stormblood experience was me just going like, is the Lord going to come here? Or is it going to go over there? Like, it, it felt very, um, Welcome shafted. to Kagane, go hang out with the shitty pirates now. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's, Kagane felt incomplete to me. Like, oh, okay, we're touching on this and now we're gone. Bye. Um, and then you're off to the Ruby Sea. The Ruby Sea was like, the Ruby Sea is a thing that conceptually interests me. And then every time we kind of go and look into a detail, I'm like, this is underwhelming. I'm not, I'm not really that interested in this. I uh, hate uh, that map. Yeah, it is a I'm really annoying gonna, map. It is a terribly <laughs> designed map. No amount of beautiful lo-fi music could convince me <laughs> to go on that map more than I have to. It's got the Susano fight, and that's it. I love that fight. That was yeah, a good yeah. fight. It's, it's, it's a really cool wonderful. fight. That's uh, kind of it. Try being a try being a gatherer in the Ruby Sea. <laughs> you have to go into the bloody trench. I have. Ruby it's a... Uh, kill me now right? especially yeah. if you especially if you have phobia of deep underwater yeah like i, like, I just if you could get attacked in that stupid trench i would just i would <laughs> <laughs> it would instantly transform into a horror game and then like yeah doma itself i'm curious as to how much like i don't know much about it so i was wondering how much chinese influence is in there uh, as right, yeah. like i didn't look that much into because it felt to me that it was kind of blending in a bunch of Chinese history in the colonial period for how Doma is set up. Daniel here. Um, I definitely see Chinese influence. Actually, when I was looking at these uh, sort of images that Liana had put together, when I opened up the Doma one, I was like, oh my God, this looks an awful lot like the, uh, the rounded houses, the uh, Tulo in Fujian. In, in China, it looks hey. like those sort of yeah, let's, rural let's dwellings. The, let's pop the yeah. I just Doma put it. I just put it. Again. I just yeah. put it on the screen. And folks who um, aren't familiar with like rural Chinese architecture, uh, you may have definitely seen this in the. I'm not even going to say it's a good movie. The live action Mulan movie, um, because it does feature <laughs> those sorts of buildings, and that that's what drew my attention to this. Also, aesthetically, this image and this is from Square Enix, so this isn't uh -huh. fan art or anything. This, I get like Xinxia vibes from the surrounding mountains and everything here. It, it honestly I strikes think, me as more Chinese. I think yeah, it's worth talking so, about too. Like that province is called Yangsha. Uh, I'm going to mute and, myself now. And in, this, in this area, you fight the monkey king, uh, Kuiten Daisheng. I think yes. is the, is the yeah, name that's they right. use. Like you fight Wukong. That's the thing you do. Then the four lords, the whole yep, yep. the whole thing with the four lords, right? Well, the four so, lords are, Jap are more Japanese. Okay, right? fair, yeah. Suzaki, Suzaki, yeah, Yanko, right, right, and, right. And Genbu. But the monkey king, though. Yes. Yeah, so like Doma honestly struck me as more like China with samurai, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like, we've got samurai and ninja for the expansion, and so Doma has them. But otherwise, it's mostly just china for the most part like it's very possible that there are big cultural touchstones i'm missing because i'm a dancey dude that's not really my uh, it's also not, not my fear, house, yeah. but playing through it it definitely felt more to me like yeah i'm playing through like a more successful boxer rebellion with more foreign support more than a take on japanese history in terms of like the historical touchstones i, I would do... say oh go ahead Leona. Uh, 
Uh, I was gonna say I do. I do have some disagreements. Go ahead and and because uh, Daniel, you you are the most I, I qualified the to speak on the disembodied culture. voice here for the for the <laughs> chat who's watching us live or on YouTube. Uh, Daniel I, reaching out from the sea of stars to reclaim I know, the ownership right? of Asian Zara um, after the coup. Um, I would say that a really good example of differentiating sort of uh, cultural signifiers within a video game world, Genshin Impact does it so well. Because if you look at Liyue and then you compare it to Inazuma, um, you see two very distinct cultures, not only in names uh, of like locations and NPCs, but also in how they're governed. Because if you look at uh, Liyue, it's governed by like a merchant class. But then if you look at Inazuma, it is far more feudal. I think it's a really good example. So when I'm looking at and I am not the, the biggest Final Fantasy fourteen fan. Uh, I tried so hard. I tried so hard to play it. Um, but when I look at these, this one immediately is like, this is China to me, um, especially with the, the ridges on the architecture and everything. Uh, definitely. And, and I feel like there are quite a few culturally Japanese touchstones in the storytelling that are worth call- calling out. I don't want to spend too much time on this because Yahtzee is going to be a lot. But um, first off, Suino Sato, uh, Ruby C again, but Suino Sato is basically the incarnation of a Japanese fairy tale of the the princess under the sea. Like when you fight the second boss in um, Shisui of the Violet Tides, there is a box that opens up and makes you old which is part of the legend where this man gets like taken to this under underwater palace and he lives there and they give him this box. And when he opens the box outside of it, he dies because it's where all of his years were stored that he wasn't aging during that time. Um, it's so, like that whole thing is, is just like, this is Japanese folklore, obviously with Susano, with all of the relics, like Susano is summoned with, with the, uh, the jewel, the sword, and the um, mirror. I think that's it. Yeah. Um, so, like, they're the dress of the the people who live in in um, the Yangsha village. I'm trying to remember uh, what it's called, but like, it's very much that kind of like Japanese peasant style, and then you see the rice patties and all of that. Um, oh, go ahead, please. Oh no, no, I'm I'm just oh, agreeing. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I do, I do definitely agree that there is quite a bit of, of China in there too. Um, and also, cause I'm going to use this to segue now. Cause I, yeah. Um, the, one of the big touchstone points of the Dolmen storyline is the acting, is the viceroy of Doma, uh, Yotsuyu, um, Yotsuyu Goe Brutus. So she is a... She is a former lady of the night. She is a former prostitute who sold out her countrymen to the Garleans, the 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 Roman Nazi thing, communist Russia, <laughs> Tsarist Russia amalgam, the, the evil empire. Um, and she is she is horrifically cruel. Um, she derives pleasure from inflicting pain upon the Doman people. Uh, she is enormously embittered. Um, and as you unwind her story, uh, it's very clear that she was she was sold to a brothel. Like she was sold into an abusive marriage, and then after her husband passed, she was sold to a brothel. And this is something that you actually see come up a lot in Japanese history. Uh, Japan has a horrific uh, tradition of sexual violence and sexual slavery against women of nations they attack, um, both in Korea and in China, um, that the government still hasn't to this day really properly apologized for. Uh, so to have this story included in Doma, I always thought was very interesting. Um, but within that, just because of the context, like Yosuyu serves to, I'm going to try not to drag us back into Alamigo too much, but she serves as kind of a contrast to an Alamigan 
uh, kind of col colonial sympathizer in Fordola, who is on the Alamegan side, who commits horrific, violent acts to gain status in the empire, and that all crumbles under her. Uh, she is eventually given something of a road to redemption. It's very long. It's it stops and starts. Uh, I personally find the story to be very interesting, but I know a lot of people don't. Um, but I think it's very interesting. Yatsuyu in contracts is the woman who could not be redeemed. And in a vacuum, I don't necessarily have an issue with that. But with her having been a victim of such horrific trauma, then it starts to get a bit squirrely for me. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm. I'm. That's pretty much my take as well on on Yatsu, and uh, it is. Uh, She's a hard pill to swallow because she's irredeemable because of the many violent things that have been done upon her. Like, you, you've created a monster out of a victim because she is a victim. And this was the only way that she could reclaim things. It's not justifying anything she did, but um, Yotsu didn't have to exist, but that is the nature of colonial violence and war of that kind, right? Um, what, but it, it, the, again, like great possibility could have been explored a whole lot better and in a lot less problematic of a fashion, I suppose. Yeah. Especially too, because if you look at her story, I think I would call her the most, one of the most like victimized people in the entirety of Florida. Yeah. It's like, it's like, I cannot think of a character who had more bullshit then you'll see you. And like it, it is heartbreaking um, because she has a little amnesia plot line where she gets a taste of, of like someone respecting her and loving her for the first time. And like, I still kind of like, I'm tearing up about it right now. Cause I'm a weenie, but like her interactions with Gosetsu who like she is, a, she is in kind of this amnesiac haze examining the gunshots that she gave him and he's treating her with kindness. And like, that that still kills me to this day, but I can't ignore the broader context of like she's such a horrible, horribly victimized person, and in the end, almost even by her own choosing, she she decides she is too broken to live on, and she basically throws herself on your sword. Um, not explicitly stated, but it's a very it's a very common and I would say very well placed read of it. Um, but I do want Bashir to give some thoughts here too, because like I don't like I don't think I really have much to add. It's kind of yeah, I don't really have much to add. She's noticeable in that her entire character arc kind of revolves around the victimization into the cycle of violence, and then the possibility of that changing, which doesn't end up happening because everything that kicked off this cycle comes back in. Um, but, like, I don't really have anything to add there that's going to meaningfully uh, change this conversation. Yeah, it's honestly, like, as a storyline, and Yotsuyu, Yotsuyu basically caps off Stormblood for, in general, Endwalker is different because Endwalker is different, but Heavensward and Stormblood and Shadowbringers, all three of them, um, they have three patches to conclude the loose ends of the main storyline. Um, so in this case, it would be 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. And then the two final patches are the setup for the next expansion. Yotsuyu is a capstone to Stormblood. Uh, in this storyline, she becomes a primal and you kill her. But during the primal fight with one of like the best gameplay storyline integrations I've ever seen, like you have to like fight off the shades of all of the people who've hurt her. And then you see like Gosetsu come in and like Gosetsu just fucking beats Xenos, like the, the strongest character in the game, because in her mind he is stronger. And like, yes, inject this into my veins. I'm a sucker for this, <laughs> whatever. Like crying my eyes out while trying to DPS. <laughs> Oh gosh, I was such a I was like a sprout of all sprouts when I played that. I think I died. Well, our group died maybe ten times. 
to that fight. Especially because it's like one of the hardest trials in the game. But uh, yeah, well, I'm a savage raider now, so I look upon those moments most fondly. But <laughs> that was a time. <laughs> I see people are are clamoring for for most punchable man Asahi. So I guess we can talk about Asahi a bit too, because I do think this is actually very interesting. Um, the just in her, in the portrayal of her family, it's there's good character moments in here of like she's adopted into their family. They are Garlean. They end up Garlean sympathizers. They basically they all sell out their country, um, but she's never one of them. And also he is the golden boy, but he's still jealous of her because she got Viceroy over him. And, and basically because of it, he destroys any chance that she could ever have to live a decent life because he specifically incites her regaining her memories and then six, like six, their parents on her when she was going to take her own life, which is another, you know, like, oh, that's yeah, thing. yeah, that's a um, thing, but it's just. The storyline is so emotionally resonant, but when you pull back some layers, you feel kind of icky. And I, I, I hate that in some respects because like... I think it's kind of like the embodiment of Stormblood as an expansion yeah. cycle. <laughs> and that it's, it's like... True. It's so true. Could it have is. been something. Really could have. It wasn't, but it could have. <laughs> like, uh, this is what you got we're in it now and I'm just like again me with the give me something <laughs> give it to me please please right <laughs> yeah. I know, there was a good point though in chat about, about Hien too that's another yeah. uh, difficult well, I, I wanted to. I want. I did want to touch on Hien as well. Yeah, before we get to um, like the good stuff, right? With Fafnir, yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, you first for Hien. Um, to, just to introduce so Hien, he, and this is my Final Fantasy VI nerdism. Um, in Final Fantasy VI, there is a uh, there is a samurai of Doma named Kayen who joins your party after the villain Kefka poisons the entire city, including his son Shin and his wife. Hien is a reimagining of the Final Fantasy VI storyline where Kayan of Doma, the Lord, lost to the Garleans, rose up to face them, and was killed. So his son Shun, who, when he comes of age, becomes Hien, is trying to reclaim it. It's a fun story. I generally like Hien as a character, but in the Yatsuyu storyline, like, you talk to him, and he's like... Yeah, the guy who sold her into prostitution, like, that was kind of fucked up, right? But, like, he's done so much for the Resistance that I guess we just gotta kind of go with it. And I'm like, maybe not. Like, my dude? <laughs> Did I seriously just hear yeah. that? Right? Because, like, in that, and that's a fun, like, dissonant moment, right? Because mm -hmm. FF14 is supposed to be your warrior of light, so that presupposes that you would have very, very different responses. And again, it's memed a lot where there are some moments where, like, you're gonna you're going to have that character thing of my character would absolutely not let that pass. Yeah. Right. It's one of those moments of like, I'm not going to do the <gasps> emoji. Like they usually see it on screen. I'm going to do the, what the fuck is wrong with you option? <laughs> if there was one. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. I wanted the option to just be like, you are my brother. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> He's, a, he's otherwise he's a very he's a very genuine likable character i saw in the chat and i do agree with this that like he's very he's very optimistic and he's he's very like playful and i appreciate that but he oh man like in this storyline oh yeah. he has some good moments mostly with his his interaction with Gossetsi, but yeah oh Ooh. I mean, I'm happy that if you do the job quest at Endwalker, spoilers for Endwalker, I'm very sorry, for the Fizz range, right? You, they do try again to recover that a little bit, because I guess they, they realize that maybe that wasn't such a good call with Yotsuyu and Hien. So you do see him actually have moments of, okay, I'm seeing the damage now. There are issues. Because the game, prior to that point, 
glosses over the whole thing where they're like, oh, he's busy. He has bigger problems. But there's the thing, right? How do these bigger problems in a post-colonial, newly liberated nation form? It's because you ignored all of those small issues. You ignored the human face, like the real victims and the ones that you should be serving as Lord, right? And obviously, I'm Hien's not my favorite, right? But I'm going to try to be critical Pam about it because it it's true that there should have been <laughs> shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? Like the yeah. Final Fantasy four, 14, Stormblood expansion, shoulda, woulda, coulda, basically <laughs> is the mood, right? And then N. Walker comes in and does it a bit better. Yeah, I think there's like, yeah, I'm very lukewarm on Hien. There are a bunch of places where it kind of stumbles, where like you have this, you have kind of his plan is very much i'm going to be lawrence of arabia and then they're going to come in and save my country for me afterwards um you have a few things where like if you were more critical about it you could do a thing on a statement of this is how things start to go wrong in a post-revolutionary government or this is how you get a um what was it like this is how you get like all of the institutional issues that stick around from colonialism perpetuating these uh things into the future but it doesn't really, like, that's not really what it's trying to do. It was just kind of, they botched what they were trying to go for with writing this particular plot line or whatever thematic uh, thing they were trying to hit with Yen. And so it lands weirdly and twists its ankle. Um, and yeah, it's, I'm. that's basically just, I don't have huge feelings on Yen. He feels, he honestly feels like kind of a footnote in an arc nominally about him. I, I honestly, even Doma, I still consider that to be Lisa's story. Because Hien, Hien serves as a vehicle to help Lisa understand who she needs to be for her people. And you see that a lot. You see them talk. And you you, you see, like, even with the facial acting of, of the Stormblood ear, which is still pretty good, even if it's not as good as Endwalker, you see her taking all of this in and seeing what he's doing and processing it. Um, like Stormblood is Lisa's story and, and I will die on this hill it's true <laughs> it is a story of Lise connecting with her people and learning to be the person that they need her to be and also the person that she truly is and not a pale imitation of her sister who she thought she had to be Man, Let's pour talk one about out. belly dancers and Thavnir show. Yeah, yeah. Pour pour one out for Stormblood, right? Let's get to Endwalker because uh, we, didn't, as much as we would all love to be with you the whole day, right? Uh, we also don't want to hold you like hostage. But I will all tell you now: if you saw me in a con, do not get me started on FF14 unless you never want me to leave you alone, right? But anyway. Favnir. Um, so I'm I'm starting with this because Iza is not here to join us, but I want to make sure that I am respecting her significant and very worthy criticisms by calling this out. So this is kind of some of the early looks we've got of Thavnir before we even um before we even saw the nation of these like exotic belly dancer style costumes that are uh as we've talked about daniel thank you for dropping the note um in episode 42 of the podcast um this like sexualization of swana women and um just like these costumes and these stereotypes which have perpetuated themselves from uh from british american literature and then made their way over to uh, Japanese representation. So early outlooks on Thavnair, where they have a lot of kind of these these sexier outfits and all of that, it's not a great start. Mm-hmm. Thavnair's existed in the setting for a long time. Yep. Um, it's been referenced. You see a lot of it. But we don't get to go to it until Endwalker, like 10 years after A Realm Reborn launches or thereabouts. And when you do get there, you can start... You finally finally start to see the progress that this this writing team has made uh i know i at least feel like especially as we were talking about with some of the role quests that they've really 
learn from some of the problems with uh, with Stormblood. Um, the inestimably talented Natsuko Ishikawa is, is heading the writing staff. Um, and I, I do think she brings a certain empathy to the writing that didn't always quite land in earlier expansions. Coffee sale just getting ca- killed off for no reason. Cough. Mm, um, gonna, I'm gonna. Mm, that's a whole nother song. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we'll talk about the shitty Catholic French elves later. Because <laughs> uh, we are here to talk about Thavnair, where even in a single city and a single zone, they've managed to really like sell this culture in ways that continue to just be really awesome and resonant uh and and i love it like there's this big fantasy outlook like the city is gorgeous like look at all of those colors look at the fact that it's on this like giant rock tree thing like it's so cool uh Mm -hmm. the picture we took uh at um of all three of our characters we took staring down the city of thavnair because it's a great, it's a great shot. Um, so let's talk about Thavnair. And Bashir, I want to start with you because you haven't, you you had to, you kind of drew back with Yatsu and let and let the the femme presenting people. Uh, uh, <laughs> have uh, our yeah, say. I love Thavnair so much. It's I think them succeeding at something they've kind of been trying to do since ARR, at portraying a location like this, at portraying a culture like this, at portraying religion and the like in a way that gets around the game's issues with it previously, that manages to negotiate the primal question and questions of faith pretty well. Um, it has like it has voice actors from the area. It has names from the area. Like there's a character called Nordin in there and Nasreen, which are like just straight up names you would expect to find in an Indian family, in a uh, in an Indian family, those two specifically an Indian Muslim family, but it also has, um, like, it managed to get all the representation you would kind of, or most of the reputation you'd kind of hope for in an Indian setting into a very compressed space, handles it respectfully, handles it in an interesting way, and um, it's generally, I think, the best they've done with something like this to uh in my eyes like it's a, a huge improvement over Ulda or Alamigo um for handling this specific kind of uh range of representation I'm also like shout out as well to Southeast Asia right because there's a lot of transcultural exchange that occurred between India and Southeast Asia so mm-hmm. when Thavnir came out especially for my Southeast Asian friends and myself we were like I just walked home that's what happened you sent me that walker and I'm home. Like I'm, I recognize the way that those carriages would look. I the hills are vibrant. Like there's the tree in my friggin' backyard, right? And you're seeing brown people is the thing. Everywhere. Seeing and hearing because yes. of the, the the casting is so incredible. Because they got a lot of Indian Britit, British Indian actors, I think, since Mm-hmm. 14 is primarily cast with British stage actors for those who, who are not aware. But phenomenal casting. Like Nidana's a giant elephant lady, and she is one of like the most adorable and wonderful ladies in this entire expansion. I wanted to kill things when things happened there. That was very yeah. I was like, I'm literally going to end the world. <laughs> <because> <laughs> here. Right. Like it I, I can't I cannot stress this enough. Looking at Favnir, flying through it and experiencing it, hearing it, even looking at the smaller details, the fish that you can fish out, the things you can gather as a gatherer, the the clothes, the the food, right? It's it, it it's that whole moment of, okay, I think that this team really is learning. They're taking notes, they're acknowledging a wider audience, they're realizing that fantasy does not have to be default white. And the very fact that, like, as an as a nation, Thavnir has its own lore, where a friggin' dragon is the one ruling that place is like, wow. And they're just cool with it. <laughs> right? Yeah, it's like, oh, great, Satrap, we love you. We've always loved you, even when you're walking around as a little kid in this doll. 
and it it remember that whole emotional moment where they are the the world is is ending around them and they have their prayers they have their rituals and they come together and here you are as player going like holy shit that is a deeply ingrained sense of spirituality and community that is solidly different from what we've been seeing in other expansions mm-hmm. and it it feels almost respectful right this time um from the minutiae down to the major points it was so well done i'm so pleased both for us southeast asians and my south asian friends where we were just waving little flags going like holy shit it's our nation right <laughs> And I'm so glad you brought up the prayer because that was something I really wanted to touch on here. Um, this is in context of Pelika Stand, where the final days have come to Eorzea. They've started in Thavnair, which means that whenever anyone is feeling hopeless or upset, they their soul is burnt up by a mysterious force and they become a horrific monster. And Matsuya, this gentle little elephant boy who's a fisher, like you first meet him when you first come to Thakner and he's like, I'm trying to sell my fish, but my merchant friend can't really help me. Can you help me? And and you go around and you try and sell his fish and you can fail. Like you can, you can, you can fail to sell this poor boy's fish. So you... Now that the world's ending, he brings he brings this prayer that the, his whole nation knows. It's 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 part of their faith and their culture, and you feel it. And then in reciting the prayer, it gives them like it helps them steal their resolve to not surrender to despair. And just like the integration of faith and culture, and oh, it's just so good. And then they threaten to kill him. It is the the most stressful fucking thing I have ever witnessed in a video game. (laughs) They have fully convinced you that they're entirely willing to kill him. Yeah, on on record, I've had people, longtime friends, who play FF14. They've never cried in their life, whether in, in that game, in this game or other games. And they were all like, I was crying during that sequence, right? Yeah. Oh man! And yeah, like, like it's it's like the zombie movie tension, but like with the sweetest little boy <laughs> who's like desperately uttering a prayer, and it's and then there's a baby and like yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I see, like, I'm, everybody can see us just go like Thavnir, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, then also, like, the post-patch content, or like, the patch content with Thavnair, where, like, they've got their own stuff going on. The entire thing where, like, you almost loot a dungeon, like, where you go into the dungeon. And <laughs> when you get back, and he's like, that that's not a horrid ruin filled with forgotten treasure. That's my stuff. <laughs> Put it back. <laughs> you can't keep that. <laughs> And you can totally say it was Astinian's idea too, just like completely throw him under the bus. Yes. <laughs> kind of kind of was. <laughs> Depending on your wall, right? Are you gremlin or are you the responsible one who is like, I'm gonna go with him to make sure nothing happens? Oh no, I broke your toys. I'm sorry. Right. I one hundred percent threw Astinian under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I did not hesitate. <laughs> But it, I'm going to say this. I'm not expecting it. I hope I'm wrong. But Thavner is the reason I have some hope that when we do eventually get to the new world, it will not be bad. Yeah. We'll yeah. yeah. I think I think we've had conversations in private uh, already about this. And I've also talked to a couple of, a couple of other players. It's my biggest fear with 7.0. Um, especially since there was a recent issue with one of the Mog Station items, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, that was a that was actually a uh, indigenous group yes. from Europe. Yes, uh, Eastern Europe, I think. I believe so. Uh, I haven't. So I, apologies, I wasn't able to review it, but that that kind of made me go, okay. There's there's a bit of a we're learning, we're getting there. 
But if you can pull off Favnir, then hopefully we can start undoing the damage of all of that and maybe not do it in the future to end up tokenizing things. Because the, in, in cultural consultancy, there should be an understanding, right? That there is, the, uh, for one, there is the untranslatable. It is a context that is not yours, never will be yours, nor can you own it or consume it. And you actually have no right to touch it, right? And so that's the untranslatable, like, uh, everybody who is not English white as a default has that thing where you, you're thinking it, that word in your language. When somebody asks you what it is, you're like, I don't, like, I don't it's, it's like this, but not really, right? That's the untranslatable. And then there's like the really sacred stuff where you're, you're just not supposed to go there and you're supposed to understand that you don't get to portray it. You don't get to speak of it. You don't get to make money off of it. Right. So I I have high hopes that um, anything that they show us a 7.0 will not do those things mm -hmm. at all. Maybe we will see. Well, and I also have high hopes that we're going to stop moving away from the white default and go more into more into that same feeling that, again, Bashir and I in particular had about Thavnir, seeing familiar things in fantasy and players realizing that yes actually you belong you and uh, you and your cultures or something like your culture belongs in this game which is played by apparently 42 million people all around the world like, that's unconscionable to me right so that's my take on it anyway absolutely um and I did want to get some fun stuff in here too, because we have mentioned, and I, I wanted to call specific attention. This is, in my eyes, this is a detail that N. Walker especially got really well and something I love to see in fantasy world building. And now it's time to talk about food. <laughs> Specifically the curry <laughs> art of the most recent patch. Right. Uh, where they just rendered a whole ass non bread and curry and like, I'm sitting here in in my new home uh, up north of Seattle, where there are no good Indian restaurants at all. And I'm playing through this, and I'm like, "Why you gotta do me dirty like this? <laughs> I can't get this right now. What the hell?" But N. Walker especially has been such has been such a fresh breath there, and that they've spent time on food and the sharing of food and kind of the bonds that come together with it, especially because N Walker does really emphasize some of these more human scenes. Like you have that time in Charlian early in the expansion where you and your closest friends and companions gather and you get burgers from like the only good restaurant in the entire godforsaken fish bread city. <laughs> What a mood, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and like the way they portray and like you see you see like Alize like picking pickles out. And then in this case, you see like Zero Zero is trading on the black market for like the hottest spices around <laughs> and just like takes out the entire restaurant by sharing this with everybody. Uh, but I love this. I love the emphasis on like food culture because it makes these people feel real. It makes you feel like less like I'm playing a video game and more like I am, I am experiencing a story with humans There were so many good food moments in Endwalker, though, honestly. Oh, yeah, right? so many, great so one. many. Um, like when right before shit hits the fan in Garlemald again, right? You have that whole scene of them sharing. I think it was a... The soup. The yeah. soup, right? That was one thing. And I think everybody that when you see Julius break down and mm -hmm. you're like, Oh man, right? And then later in the in the patches, when he starts sharing, was it booch? Is that it, it, it was the the Azim step the the um, yeah. I want to say bun hey. bao because uh, that, <laughs> that's what it is to me, right? Um, uh, the bao, the yeah. the meat bun, yeah. and he yeah. shares that with zero. 
And I also uh, found that really funny on the on a fandom level, honestly, because again, again, brown girl, right? So it's a right. lot of and and there's a lot of Chinese Filipino cultural exchange down in my country. Um, I saw so many articles of people going, "My people are freaking out over this food," and I'm just like, "Hey, shop out, right?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like oh, pan pan ba, okay, cool. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, that shit's good. <laughs> you eat it up, white people, if you don't know what it is. <laughs> well, well, welcome, welcome to the club, white people. We have good food. <laughs> and that's important as well. Again, that's a cultural consultancy hat on. It's important as well because food, it, the history of portrayal of cultures always goes into, I can't stomach their food. It's too much, right? Mm-hmm. It's too much. It's too exotic. Or you try it because it's... Uh, it's different, right? But and yet there was such nuance and care in portraying its importance here and the the the, the sense of community of humanity, right? So you don't exotify it, you don't exotify it anymore. Uh, you make it real, and you give it, uh, you treat it with care and compassion, time and resources, because you know making a game is costly. Every minute, every rendering, all the assets, it, it takes time. So, but they use that time productively. Yeah, like if you look at that non bread, it's a very far it's a very far cry from the squapes, the square grapes. <laughs> uh, which, if you are curious what that means, just type in Endwalker, S Q U A P E S, and and you will see some of their their less lovingly rendered uh, food stuffs. <laughs> but like, look look at this. Look at this. Like, look at the non bread. Look at the detailing on it. That curry, like, I want to eat that. And that's agreeing with Pam. Like, they make Thavnair food look amazing. And, like, you want to eat it. And that's important. A shout out to Astinian, too, that, like, he has this whole thing where you're running around with him and he points out the rails. Does it? And he's just like, I love that shit. Give me some of that, right? <laughs> and the calamari ripiani. Uh, one of the dishes that became my crafter's best friend for a very long time. Uh, the the squid, the the, the the what you fish out is also one of his favorite things, right? He talks about it all the time. So it's care, nuance, compassion. And I, I guess like that would be mostly my conclusion for this whole thing. The hope, at least, that both FF16 shows at least a little bit of that and if it doesn't may it stand as a testament to great game could have been so much better let's hope that 7.0 and other future final fantasies should they choose to exist take those directions as well i don't know that that's necessarily a choice so much as them it's like (laughs) do you want to make naoki yoshida do it or do you want it to not exist those are kind (laughs) of your two options right (laughs) Um, Bashir, did you have any? Oh God! No, I think I'll grab the squapes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to call attention to the squapes, but uh, I'm fairly happy with covering it in as much depth as we as we have. I'm glad I got to talk about Savnair. Um, it might be worth like glancing at like Ulda is pretty much supposed to be Arab. It's not 100, percent but it's like they have a sultana. They're pretty clearly like the standard desert um, location set. A white um, blonde sultana, we do have to point out. I love Nanamo, but she too should be yeah. darker. <laughs> um, and it's got some, like, it has a lot of the same issues that Alamigo does, I think, uh, with how it is portrayed. Uh, there isn't really anything super new in there, save that, like, Everything resolving Ulda is kind of half on pause, where like after like after Nanamo gets put back in, we kind of just don't touch Ulda for main plot stuff, really. Or like after um Stormblood finishes, we just don't well, touch Well they, they kind of plot. resolve Ulda in Stormblood with the return of the Bull Quest line where Nanamo figures out how to deal with Teleji at Aleji. Yeah. So it's it's basically it's very heavily implied that like Nanamo has got this shit on lock, so Ramon yeah, can return home. It's very like it's got a <laughs> bunch of similar issues to Alamigo. Some of the, some of it it's managed to handle, and then it's kind of just slid off screen to a degree in the same way that 
a bunch of that uh like Gradania is also mostly slid off screen. Limsa I think gets more main quest stuff than either of them. Gradania deserves its own episode. Yeah. <laughs> oh For yes. the record, that's my least uh, favorite the city state. Is probably, uh, the Thank you, Bashir. To... You've done. done. Let's make an episode. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sequel. Oh, God, uh, oh man, Gradania. Oh, it's just like you know not what you ask for. I yep. know. <laughs> but like, um, and just for for people who are playing FF14, there is actually a resolution in a yellow quest. Uh, that's another thing that you can, the slit off screen whole thing. There is a yellow quest that I found by accident where it talks about how, um, who is the small evil Lalafell that's no longer so evil? Uh, oh, uh, Lolarita. Taleji Adeleji? There you go, yeah. Um, he... Or, well, Taleji Adeleji, excuse me, is, is the... Taledi Adeleji is now Taledi Adeleji, if that makes sense. <laughs> okay. um, Lolorito is the one who's, who's, oh, yeah, who's Lola, still in yeah. one piece. <laughs> right. Uh, they, you can talk to one of the refugees and you help him broker a deal to give these refugees jobs by yeah. introducing him to Lolorito. So that's part of the side quest. You can see if you do, I think it was is it Goldsmith. My partner's going to kill me. I should know this as a crafter. Uh, but there is an entire quest line where you do have... Yeah, I think it's Goldsmith. Where I think you, it's Goldsmith, yeah. You have that school where you hold, you showcase Alamegan goods. Yeah, and that's in Rogers Reach. Yeah, Goldsmith. Yeah, there you go. Right, so little, little resolutions. Again, attempts mm-hmm. later to tie in some of the glaring, like, okay, one and done <laughs> that yeah. you have with a lot of the city states. And honestly, like as a from a, just a a world building and resources perspective, like it kind of again, this is not an excuse, but it does make sense. The world of fourteen has become so expansive, and it continues to expand with every expansion. Like in Shadowbringers, we got an entire world, which we will hopefully be able to get back to because my gay daughter deserves the <laughs> world. And if you do not give her back to me, I will burn <laughs> I know, something. Right? <laughs> I'm going to kill a bitch is where I'm at. Right? <laughs> I'm going to kill several. Okay. <laughs> um, there, There's a lot in here. And I think it means a lot that the team is willing to revisit and try and better even the work that they've done before. And I think writ large... The thesis of this entire episode, at least to me, is that don't excuse the mistakes of the past, but keep trying to fix it. And you may never get there, but that effort is meaningful. And if you make positive steps towards it, it will make your work better. Yeah, that's that's a great way of closing it, honestly. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I'm 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 thrilled that I managed to keep us in time because I've been watching that clock like a hawk. Yeah, both of us. Right? We're just like you still have time. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Uh, great. Oh, I mean, it's a great. It's been a great episode for me. Oh yeah, to, like, no, I, this is, I, I could not ask for a better inaugural episode. Thank you all for 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 standing with me as I coo Daniel out of out of the uh, the seat of, of Asians represent. Yeah, except for all those times that he. Uh, he, he managed Provide to come full back political as a support voice. to the Liana administration and hope the uh, coup resolves. It's going to be Team execution. Liana and Team Daniel shirts. We're going to have like, <laughs> be like a whole thing. Ooh, big bad. Might con. have to be like the weebiest fucking shirts ever. Oh yeah, like... we could. What if we made like a poster and we're like standing back to back and it's like Naruto and Sasuke? Oh. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I think so. I think so. <laughs> Well, let, I, I believe we've got, we've got, so uh, once again, uh, my name is Leon McKenzie. Uh, I'm one of the co-hosts for Asians Represent. Super, super happy to be here. Uh, my shows will be focusing on video games, anime, often Asian media, and what it says about us, what we can learn from it, uh, or if I just think it's particularly cool and I've decided that you're going to listen to me talk about it for two hours, you know, that might happen too. Um, but yeah, super happy to be here. Uh, we'll get uh, Pam and Bashir if you both want to. We'll we'll start with Bashir, uh, and then and then we'll get to the Patreon read. 
Hey, I'm Bashir Gauss, a uh, writer, game designer, etc. It has been super great to be here. I really enjoyed the episode. Um, my current project is Guns Blazing. Uh, I finished its Kickstarter a couple of months ago, but you can pre-order it. Uh, if you go to find it, Guns Blazing on Kickstarter, there's a link to the pre-order page, and you can go ahead and buy the book. So I'm Pam. I do game design, editing, cultural consultancy, which I was talking your off for a very long time about. And yes, I'm a hardcore FF14 player, currently also in Star Rail, currently also waiting for FF16, but I cannot quit FF14, so you can find me, Crystal, Balmong, if you need me to raid, sure, I got you back. I play Dark Knight and a bunch of other things. Uh, expect to see my tiny, angry here by Hikaru Shinta, so it's Chris Balmong if you need to find me. <laughs> Uh, my current project right now, I've got a lot, but they're under NDA lock. Uh, but one is not the Blades in the Dark supplement. We are currently doing revisions and layout and preparing it for playtesting. And that's all going to be about Southeast Asia through um, the Dagger Isles. Awesome. You love to see it. And of course, we would not be here and we would not be able to operate without the assistance of our wonderful patrons. Um, so we'll, uh, our patrons continue to support the show, support us, um, and with a special, special shout out to our most honorable patrons, uh, the Metal Weave Games, uh, interesting one, we'll get back to that other one. Uh, you Michelle could say it, Stephane. say it, say it, you could say it. I'm, I'm saving it for last. Oh, okay. I, 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 get to, <laughs> I get to toot my own horn last. Uh, the most honorable times two Epic Impulse, thank you again for all of your support. Uh, Bob C. and Brooke Bright. And then, of course, me, Valorous Games, because that's my studio. And I also publish for, uh, or will be publishing uh, things for Asian Threat. So there's more cool things to look forward to for that. Uh, but thank you again. We could not do these shows and give you the, the content that we're able to without your support. Uh, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. But with that, uh, that was us talking slash screaming slash ranting about Final Fantasy XIV. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. I hope it gave you some things to think about with how you want to treat your own worlds. Um, I hope it made you appreciate least more because if so, then I've done my job. Uh, and yeah, thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time. <laughs>